Berkshire Hathaway is the seventh largest company in the United States by both revenue and market capitalization, but it wasn't always this way. In the 1950s, Berkshire did make the Fortune 500 list, but was ranked 499th in 1959 and then fell off the list in 1960. Fast forward to 1990 though, and the story had changed as Berkshire was back on the Fortune 500 list, ranked 179th, and it was ranked 12th in 2005, and now is ranked 7th. So how did Berkshire Hathaway go from a dying textile company in the 50s to a thriving conglomerate today with many businesses in insurance, manufacturing, retail, service, and also having a massive stock portfolio. The main answer, of course, is Warren Buffett, but I wanted to know more about the business, so I read this behemoth of a book, which is called The Complete Financial History of Berkshire Hathaway by Adam Mead. Uh, so in this video, I'll be talking a little bit about the history of Berkshire Hathaway and some of the major events along the way, and then I'll also include at the end some lessons and ideas that I learned from the book um, that were kind of helpful for me and maybe could be helpful for you as well moving forward. Berkshire Hathaway actually has a very long history with the earliest known predecessor companies dating back to the early 19th century, but the company of Berkshire Hathaway itself was formed in 1955 from the merger of two textile companies in New England called the Hathaway Manufacturing Company and Berkshire Fine Spinning Associates. Um, so this company was headquartered in Massachusetts and like I said, most of its operations were in that New England area. Um, but because of fierce competition in the textile industry from companies in the southern United States and then also some countries throughout the world, uh, Berkshire Hathaway really struggled in the 1950s. Their revenue and earnings you know, steadily declined throughout that time period and into the early 1960s. And eventually the stock was trading at a price per share that was far below the tangible book value of the company. And that caught the eye of a young investor named Warren Buffett, who began buying shares for his investment partnership, which was called Buffett Partnerships Limited. And by 1965, BPL owned over $14 million of Berkshire stock, which ended up putting Buffett in charge of the company. And one of the first things that Buffett started doing, aside from trying to optimize the textile business a little bit and cutting costs, is that he started to move the company away from the textile industry. And that first happened with the purchase of the National Indemnity Company in 1967, which was an insurance company. And from this point forward, Buffett built a profitable and growing insurance operation uh, that used its profits to acquire other operational businesses. And some of Buffett's notable early purchases were blue chip stamps, which was actually a similar business to Berkshire Hathaway in the sense that its core business, which was sort of a trading stamp business, was really struggling and declining, but it had assets on hand that could be used to purchase other businesses. So that was one of the first ones. And then also they purchased Seas Candies, which is a candy retailer um, on the West Coast in California, and then Buffalo News, which is the newspaper in Buffalo, New York. And throughout this time, Buffett continued investing heavily in common stocks as well. And notably, he started a position in Geico in the 1970s when they ran into some financial troubles. And then in 1996, Berkshire uh, acquired the rest of Geico, making it a fully owned subsidiary. And throughout the years, Berkshire just kept acquiring businesses and common stocks. Uh, some of the more well-known businesses they own are stuff like Dairy Queen, and like I said, Geico, and then also Fruit of the Loom, and they own a very large um, railroad company in BNSF. And they have some notable stock investments as well. One of their most famous probably is Coca-Cola. So Buffett bought um, some Coca-Cola in the late 1980s and early 1990s for a total of $1.3 billion invested there. But now, you know, 20, close to 30 years later, over 30 years later, uh, those shares are worth more than $20 billion, more like $23 or $24 billion. And they pay Berkshire over $700 million annually in dividends, which is, you know, over a 50% yield on costs, which is pretty cool. And then a more recent investment from Berkshire is um, Apple, which is notable because it's a technology company and that's 
traditionally something that Berkshire and Warren Buffett have sort of shied away from because they're not as knowledgeable about that. But he started buying Apple in 2016 and continued buying throughout 2018. Uh, their initial cost on that Apple position was $36 billion, but only a few years later, those shares are now worth a whopping $160 billion, which is pretty impressive. Berkshire's record is truly astonishing. Since 1965, the stock's share price has compounded at an average rate of about 20%, which is pretty much double what the S&P 500 has done per year um, in that time frame. But because of the pretty long time span, that has produced an investment result for Berkshire over 100 times that of the S&P 500 over that same time period. So what exactly did I learn about Warren Buffett's strategy um, from this book? So actually before reading this book, I did know quite a bit about Berkshire Hathaway and Warren Buffett and kind of their history. So I previously read The Snowball by Alice Schroeder, which is a biography of Warren Buffett that goes up through 2009. Um, and that talks a lot about Buffett and his early life and then also throughout obviously since he was so involved with Berkshire it talks a lot about Berkshire um, but it definitely didn't have the level of detail that um, this book has and then I've also read pretty much all the annual reports um, going back to when Buffett purchased Berkshire um, and then also even some of his uh, kind of annual letters that he sent out to his partners in BPL from the late 1950s I read some of those as well um, so I definitely learned a lot about the company through those letters but there's also some kind of messages and lessons I learned in this book um, that are kind of unique to this book that just kind of things I hadn't quite looked at in that sort of light. Um, so the first one revolves around taxes. And when we talk about investing strategies, lots of investors, which kind of includes myself to some degree, um, invest in companies that pay dividends and, um, you know, are really excited about the dividend and kind of sometimes get attracted to a company solely because of the dividend and there's nothing really inherently wrong with that but uh, the tax situation and implications of incremental dividends over time is important to understand versus you know just selling shares when you choose to and then paying capital gains at that time and the way i got some more clarity and a different perspective on this is through the discussion of deferred tax liabilities on berkshire's balance sheet so because they have a large amount of unrealized gains in their investment portfolio they have a deferred tax liability on the balance sheet that represents what they would have to pay in capital gains tax were they to sell those investments and the way Buffett thinks about this is that it's a loan from the government in the sense that eventually when they sell those investments, they'll have to pay the government uh, those taxes. But Berkshire is essentially able to invest more and have a larger investment portfolio now because they don't have to pay those taxes yet. And therefore, the portfolio can compound uninterrupted. Um, whereas if you had to pay taxes every year on dividends in some proportional amount, then those taxes theoretically compound over the time, over time in the form of lower gains in your investment. Um, and right now on Berkshire's balance sheet, their deferred tax liability is around $93 billion. So that's a pretty significant amount that they are able to pretty much defer and just continue compounding in their portfolio um, as opposed to having to pay more taxes over time. So that's a pretty a pretty valuable thing that um, is you know listed as liability, but that's sort of a good thing for their business as well. Um, and that's not to say that you shouldn't invest in companies that pay dividends or kind of try to avoid dividends. Um, for me, it was more of just a lesson on some of the drawbacks of dividends and just another way of thinking about it and just making sure that you understand that taxes can have a big impact on any investment portfolio. Another thing I learned a lot about throughout the book was valuation, um, and it was actually pretty helpful because periodically the author would kind of put together a calculation of what Berkshire's you know fair value might be at that point in time and kind of compare it to the book value and the stock price and showcase how over time, generally speaking, the um, difference between the book value and the intrinsic value and that ratio kind of got larger over time, meaning that um, the company today is worth a lot more than their book value. Um, and the ratio of, you know, intrinsic value to book value today is a lot higher than it was, you know, back in the 1970s or 80s, for example. Um, so this kind of ties in to some degree how assets and liabilities are accounted for on the balance sheet and whether in some cases you know assets might be worth more or less in reality than accounting rules say they are and similarly liabilities might be worth more or less 
than accounting rules say they are. So one of the big liabilities for Berkshire Hathaway as an insurance company is their insurance float. And if you're not familiar, basically float is just funds that Berkshire has collected and earned in the form of insurance premiums, but they haven't had to pay that out yet to you know their customers in the form of claims. So that's a pretty big um, asset in some regard for insurance companies because that's really how they make money is they you know earn premiums and then pay out the claims and along the way they have this float that they can invest and earn returns on um, and that's really how they, a lot of insurance companies make money um, but in terms of the balance sheet the float is a liability because they're going to have to pay it out over time at some point in the future but um, it doesn't behave exactly like a liability um, like i've kind of alluded to so First of all, it never is really going to have to be paid out all at once um, as various policies have various terms. And as long as Berkshire's insurance operations, you know, continue earning similar premium volumes over time as they pay claims out of their float, they're going to be um, writing new policies. And so the float will be replenished by new policies that are written. Um, so they're really not going to have to worry about, you know, actually diminishing the value of their float. And most importantly, float is used, like I said before, to invest and earn returns for the company. Um, so, you know, that's a pretty valuable asset. Um, and additionally, unlike many insurers, Berkshire actually has a pretty high standard of underwriting discipline. And so they record an underwriting profit in most years, which means they bring in more premiums than they pay out in claims, um, which means that their float realistically has really no cost and that very often they get actually paid for holding that float and investing it. And that becomes a very powerful tool because they do get to invest that float. Um, and so they're earning money you know, on the premiums up front, and then they're also able to earn money on the float. And that makes, uh, you know, Berkshire a very strong company. And um, they have a very strong record as well of earning very good returns on their investments, which um, all combines together to be a very good combination. Another way that the valuation of assets can be skewed from economic reality is through the use of goodwill. So when Berkshire Hathaway buys a company, more than likely they're going to have to pay more than the tangible book value of that company. So um, in order to reconcile that on the balance sheet, the difference between the purchase price and the book value of the acquired company is put on Berkshire's balance sheet as an asset called goodwill. Um, so essentially the goodwill um, of that company plus the book value will equal the purchase price. And so initially this is an accurate representation of the economic transaction that took place. But over time, the goodwill on the balance sheet may fall out of line with the true value of the acquired company. So let's use Geico as an example, as um, that is a company that Berkshire owns in full. So when Berkshire bought uh, the second half of Geico in 1996, they paid about $2.3 billion, which means the implied valuation for the whole company was $4.6 billion. Um, and their tangible book value of Geico at that point in time was 1.9. So the goodwill that got placed on the balance sheet or the total goodwill at that point would have been about $2.7 billion. Um, and actually just because they only bought half of the company, the goodwill that was put on the balance sheet for Geico was about $1.4 billion. Um, but anyway, the premium volume was $2.8 billion per year at that point in time, which implies that the value of Geico's customers and brand is similar to that of the annual premium value because that $2.7 billion of goodwill is pretty close to 2.8 billion dollars of premium volume right um, so like i said berkshire carries geico on its books at a value of 1.4 billion dollars and because of accounting rules that never changes over time unless that goodwill goes down or that book value goes down um, and if it goes up that doesn't matter they continue to carry the um, value of geico at 1.4 billion dollars but um, in 2022, Geico earned premiums of $38 billion, which implies a valuation for Geico around $35 billion, something like that, um, which is way more than the goodwill carried um, for Geico on Berkshire's balance sheet. So we can see in this case that the goodwill um, on Berkshire's balance sheet for Geico really drastically underrepresents the true value of Geico as a business, and therefore, um, 
Berkshire's true value as a business is underrepresented by the assets on their balance sheet. And that's just one example because Berkshire owns many businesses in full that they've owned for a long time. And it's a good bet that a lot of those businesses are worth a lot more than the goodwill that's accounted for on Berkshire's balance sheet. So I think it's pretty safe to say that Berkshire Hathaway is a very impressive and interesting company. And there's a lot to be learned from Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger. So I highly recommend learning more about the company and reading this book if you're interested. Um, I certainly learned a lot from the book. So if you have any questions, definitely let me know in the comments below or feel free to join the free Discord server as well and ask me there. So I think it's pretty clear that Berkshire Hathaway is a very impressive and interesting company and there's probably a lot to be learned from Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger. So I highly recommend learning more about the company and reading this book if you're interested. Again, it's called The Complete Financial History of Berkshire Hathaway by Adam Mead. Um, I certainly learned a ton from the book. So if you have any questions, definitely let me know in the comments below, or you can join the free Discord server as well and ask there. Um, I also did attend the Berkshire Hathaway annual meeting this past May. Um, so if you wanna hear more about that experience, I'll leave a link uh, somewhere up here to that video. And uh, if you wanna check that out, thanks for watching to the end of the video. I really do appreciate it. And I'll see you all in the next one.